Every day when you wake up, do you pick up a bucket and go down to the stream to fetch water? No, you probably go to a tap, open the tap that comes out of the wall, and get some water for yourself. You might not even know where the water comes from. You might not even care. It's just there. Every day when you go to work, do you wade a river on your way? I presume not. You probably walk, uh, you bike, you drive along the streets or the roads. There may be a river somewhere in the landscape. It's a static feature of the scenery. It's the set of a stage on which we live our life at the rhythm of uh, modernity. Water is everywhere. 90% of us, 90% of all people on the planet, live within 10 kilometers of a water body. Anything, anything that is green and grows requires water. The, the planet is almost virtually covered with it. And yet, we behave as if our life is mostly unaffected by it. We have water when we need it and, and no more. It's an illusion of control, an illusion of control. An illusion that from the droughts that you saw this summer in Europe to the floods in Pakistan is breaking. Let me tell you a story. Many, many centuries ago, a god spoke to a man, a great patriarch, and he told him that a great flood would come and cover the earth. And so the man built a vast boat it was an acre in size, it was six decks, ten poles high, a big roof on top. And he put on it uh, his uh, family, seeds, animals, any animals he could find, anything he owned, and then put out to sea. And the flood came and covered everything. Everybody drowned. The man floated for days and days and days, and nights and nights and nights. And eventually he chose to send out a bird a dove, to find land. But the bird found none and came back. A few days later, sent another bird out to find land. But the bird again came back. A few days later still, a third bird. And this time, the bird didn't come back. It found land. The boat landed on a mountain. The floodwaters drained away, and life began again. Now, you'll be familiar with the story. Uh, you will recognize it, of course, as the story of Noah and the ark. But it actually isn't. It's not the story of Noah and the ark. It's the story of a great Mesopotamian patriarch called Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the Epic of Gilgamesh was written maybe 1,500 years before Genesis was written in the Old Testament. In fact, the story of Utnapishtim goes back in time to the Sumerian tradition, many millennia before. In reality, this is a story that recurs in human societies everywhere on the planet. Uh, it's a very, very common one. It's, uh, for example, the story of the frost giant Bergelmir of the Norse tradition, who built a boat to save himself and his wife from a great flood. Or it's the story of the Lenape tribe of Manahatta, the original inhabitants of uh, Manhattan, who thought they were the descendants of a people that survived a great flood. Or it's the story of Unupachakuti, the, the great flood that covered the earth in the Inca tradition. Or it's the story of the Jade Emperor of the Celestial Empire of China, who trapped four great dragons in the mountains, only for them to change into rivers and flood the plains of China. And these were, of course, the Pearl, the Amur, the Yellow River, and the Yangtze. This story is even available in the song lines of the Aboriginal tribes of Australia, who were locked up for millennia in the continent, and who sing of a time when the land was covered in water. Our relationship with water, in fact, started about 10,000 years ago in the Levant, when some societies decided to stand still in a world of moving water. 
It was the great Neolithic Revolution, you will have studied it at school. It was the time when some societies committed to sedentary agriculture, and that, that was the time when our relationship with water uh, was transformed, when we confronted the full force of water. You see, water is the agent of the climate system on the landscape. Water is the agent of the climate system on the landscape. The droughts, the floods, are nothing but the symptoms of Earth's climate. And these phenomena transcend the individual. No individual here could manage by themselves a flood or a drought. They require us to exercise our collective agency, a collective action, to manage a difficult and dangerous environment. And so, over the centuries, uh, human societies uh, worked together to dig canals and build levees to contain rivers. Or they built dams or developed cisterns to catch water when it came down from the sky. They literally replumbed the landscape so as to create an artificial ecosystem that supports all of our lives. But in doing so, they did also something else. They shaped political institutions. We are, as Aristotle once said, the zone politikon, the political animal. Politics is how we organize our collective action. It's how we decide together who decides. It is how we compel ourselves to cooperate, to work with each other. And politics, the distribution of power in society, well, that's also the most powerful instrument for us to manage this overwhelming force of water. And our dance with water started 10,000 years ago and shaped all political institutions that regulate our life, our life today. Think of democracy, for example. The great Athenian project, the reforms of Solon and Cleisthenes that poured power into the Greek society and empowered Athenian citizens. Now, citizens were mostly farmers in Athens, but they were wealthy enough to buy themselves the heavy armor and the heavy weaponry that it was of the hoplites, the protagonists of the Greek phalanx. And because of their military power and because of their arms, they became the great defenders of the polis. You'll remember, in the Persian and Peloponnesian wars. That's how they justified their political agency. That's how they gained political rights. But farmers could afford that armor and those weapons because they were wealthy, because their fields, fed by rains that were abundant and reliable, made them capable of buying what they needed to become hoplites. In a sense, in Attica, you could map rainfall on the distribution of power. Now, it's not that rain caused democracy, of course, but in the journey, the relationship between Greek society and the landscape and the water landscape shaped, shaped its journey. Or think of Roman law, right? The legal system that was codified by Justinian, which glued together the commercial roots of the Roman Empire so that grain, the product of rainfall from all over the empire, could be reliably brought and sold on the markets of Rome. Law was the answer to the problem of figuring out who was responsible for what in a moving landscape, for what were moved in the landscape, connected and covered by water. Then, medieval scholars fished the Justinian Code out of the darkness of history around the 12th century and integrated it into Europe. And it was a system of such lucidity and coherence that it spread like wildfire. And in fact, today, all of our legal systems, almost all over the world, are essentially rooted in that journey that started 2,000 years ago, and it's rooted uh, in water. Even international modern relations, international relations are rooted in water. You remember humanists in this country actually gave us the concepts of rights and sovereignty. But it was the treaties of Westphalia the treaties between the Lords States General of the Dutch Republic and the Spanish Crown, right? one of the first in the 17th century, an agreement between two sovereign nations, a monarchy and a republic, for the first time on equal standing. Well, it was that agreement that started international relations, and it's the basis for all agreements ever since, including, including the UN Charter, 
Those agreements that are all under strain today from conflicts that are happening along or across the rivers of the world, whether it's the Dnieper River in Ukraine or the sources of the Indus in Kashmir. And finally, the modern republic, of course. All the American presidents uh, during the Progressive Era, all the way up to Roosevelt, wanted to rescue America from a succession of economic crises and empower their citizens. And in order to do so, they turned to the rivers of the country. The Hoover Dam on the Colorado River, the great levees that contain the great Mississippi, the Tennessee Valley Authority, these are all projects that were the exercise of sovereignty of a republic on the landscape of a nation. They ex exchange security for power, and in doing so, defined a modernist project that defined what everybody imagines a republic should look like on the landscape. Today, three quarters of the countries of the world call themselves republics, and they've all designed their water management, they've all designed their landscape on that model, on that American model that started in the first half of the 20th century. It is the stratification of all these institutions, the layering of all of these stories, that ensures that we don't even notice that none of us wades a river on the way to work, and that all of us draw water from a tap that sticks out of a wall. We live in an illusion of control because of the infrastructure and institutions that we built over thousands of years. And so we come to today, because cracks are appearing in that illusion. Water is on the move. Water is the agent of the climate system. And as the climate changes, so does water. The droughts and floods are wreaking havoc on the normalcy of a life that we thought, we thought emancipated from the variability of nature. The giant, the water giant, is exceeding the boundaries we had imposed on it. In the extreme, failure to manage a changing condition may mean that some parts of the world become uninhabitable deserts. Others may become unmanageable wetlands. The most vulnerable will be displaced. Some will look for better places to live, proving that in a changing world, the biggest risk we face may not, in the end, be a flood of water, but one of people. So how do we avoid becoming the survivors of an age that failed to deal with the most powerful force on Earth? How do we avoid uh, being remembered in 2,000 years as Utnapishtim? The Romans described moving water on the landscape, the flowing water that surrounds us, as res publica, the property of the state, a common property, a commonwealth. And it's in those words that lies the solution to our relationship with water and a changing environment. We must recognize that even if today we don't have to wade a river on the way to work yet, water flows in space and time and transforms our home. When the illusion of control finally breaks, our most profound responsibility, our most profound responsibility will be to decide together what we see when we look out of the window. Our duty as citizens is to express collective agency through the political institutions. We, here, all of us, are now citizens of an environmental republic. It is a system of infrastructure and institutions that sits between us and the power of water. We should vote accordingly. Thank you.